good. Welcome to this uh, extra uh, unusual session of the virtual seminar on precision physics and fundamental symmetries on a Tuesday. And uh, at the same time, a Dikomat uh, colloquium here in Hanover. This is a hybrid event. We have uh, people joining us remotely and uh, a full audience on site here. Um, this is just the short technical introduction. I will now hand over the uh, microphone to Pete Schmidt, who will introduce our speaker. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christian. Uh, thank you very much uh, here in the lecture hall and also remotely. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure that Mariana Savronova is our uh, guest speaker for the colloquium here today. And uh, let me just briefly <coughs> introduce her to you. Um, Mariana has received her PhD in 2001 uh, from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, after that, she joined uh, NIST as a guest researcher, and uh, not even two years later, she uh, got a faculty position at the University of Delaware, where by now she's a full professor. Um, she's also an adjunct uh, fellow uh, of the Joint Quantum Institute, uh, the JQI, that's um, a consortium between or a collaboration between uh, NIST and the University of Maryland. She had many guest visits to JQI, uh, the University of New South Wales and uh, CNRS in, in Marseille. Uh, she is extremely active on uh, a large number of uh, panels and committees. Uh, for example, she's a member of the editorial board of PRA. She's the editor uh, of, or used to be an editor of the quantum science and technology. Uh, journal. Uh, she's a member of the physical sciences panel for a decadal survey on biological and <coughs> physical science research in space. That's a very long title. Uh, she's a convener for the European strategy for particle uh, physics uh, on the quantum sensor detection research and development uh, roadmap implementation. Um, and uh, she does a lot of other community work at, uh, for the APS, uh, for the GRC, and uh, many other activities. So I, I could go on for the entire duration of the talk, for talk essentially, which I won't. Yeah? Uh, let's leave it at, at that. Yeah? Um, I, another uh, very important contribution uh, for the community is uh, her having set up uh, together with uh, colleagues um, from the computer science department at, at the University of Delaware, the atomic uh, structure portal, uh, where you can uh, type in and query atomic structure data uh, and uh, have uh, in the background uh, run the calculations for you. Essentially. Uh, I think that's a, a great progress for the community because there's a strong demand in atomic structure data. Uh, she also uh, has received a number of prizes. In 2011, she became a fellow of the APS. Um, in 2012, uh, she was uh, the Roman Physicist of the Month from the APS. Um, in 2013, um, she won the Outstanding Scholar Award of the University of Delaware and received several Gordon Godfrey uh, fellowships from the University of New South Wales. So I do not want to take more of your time, Mariana. It's uh, great to have you here, and uh, we're very much looking forward to the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the introduction uh, <clears throat> and for the invitation. So one, no, that's not working. Not sure why the slide. Uh, okay, I can, I guess, change slides. Uh, the pre now something is wrong. I can't even. Uh, okay. I don't think so. Oh, okay. All right. So 100 years ago, we kind of thought we knew everything about the universe. It looks like um, they've only been an issue of measuring for a few more significant figures. And uh, they have been a, new, a lot of new technologies. And of course, have been you know, trains, planes, new, um, many new ideas. 
But nevertheless, there was, of course, this puzzle of atomic spectrum, which people had no idea why it looks like this. And of course, there have been all those other interesting effects, all those Rengen rays and other things. <clears throat> and surprisingly, that actually haven't bothered quite a lot of people, even the scientists. But now we know that solution of those puzzles, those fundamental physics puzzles of the 100 years ago, led us to actually quantum mechanics and why we're here describing quantum technologies. And quantum mechanics revolutionized our world and our technologies. And now we are back essentially full circle. We now have detected all of the particles to the standard model. So there is also kind of possibility to think maybe we already know everything. By the way, can people hear me in the back? Okay. And we have our fundamental physics postulates, we have quantum mechanics, we have general relativity, and of course we know there are problems. Even just with the standard model, we know that the Higgs, uh, for example, field is just barely on and it's very unnatural. I mean, it's very natural to have a universe where the Higgs field is off and all particle masses are zero, or uh, when the Higgs uh, is infinitely heavy and then all particles are black holes. It's very natural as to have some weird random numbers, what it is right now. And then, of course, neutrinos actually do mix, which means they have masses. And that's not accounted for the standard model. We don't have the mechanism for doing so. But of course, the standard models have a biggest problem. And it's not just a couple of sigma here and three sigma there. It's the fact that if standard model was true, we would not exist. Because in our universe, somehow, in early universe, it so happened when matter and antimatter, which was produced in pretty much the same quantities, annihilated, one matter particle out of a billion was left. And that is uh, generated by the charge parity violation, which we have in the standard model, but it's very, very tiny. It's not enough to account for this huge matter-antimatter asymmetry. And we're kind of pretty sure that uh, we don't have those antimatter galaxies hiding somewhere. People have looked. And then one of the biggest puzzle is that we actually don't know what universe is made of. Those beautiful stars which you see at the night sky, it's only 0.5% of matter energy content of the universe. And then the fact that we have those two different things, dark matter and dark energy, they come from different observational uh, effects. We're pretty sure those are two different things, but we don't know what either of that is. And that's actually been persisting puzzle now for many decades at this point. With dark energy, we go back at least two decades. With dark matter, we go back on almost 100 years as of now, till 1933, when it was first suggested. And now the solving fundamental physics puzzle of 100 years ago gave us quantum technologies. And now we can use quantum technologies to open new ways to search for new physics and test fundamental physics postulates. Because uh, frankly, when we compare experiments, we assume the clock here and the clock in uh, Japan, they work the same way. But if the, <clears throat> there is a violation of, for example, Lorentz invariance or the violation of local position invariance, then it's not so. In this case, assuming that those things are invariably true, maybe a problem. Maybe those new physics will show up as a systematic of, new, of your quantum technology experiments. But also, we can build dedicated devices <clears throat> which are specifically very sensitive to those new physics effects. And one of the you know, biggest challenges in uh, particle physics and uh, AMO physics recently have been find out what those new effects are and what those dedicated experiments you can build to look for them. And many of them actually done here. And uh, mostly I will talk about dark matter searches because I find it particularly interesting. So why search dark for dark matter? Well, there's fairly high level conf of confidence is because it's there. And uh, while, of course, uh, there may be some alternative explanation, but of uh, numerous observations which lead us to believe there is dark matter, so far we actually haven't found any alternative explanations which explain all those things. And just very briefly, I will touch upon why we think that dark matter is there. Well, you may have heard about rotational curves of galaxies or the <clears throat> gravitational lensing, the bullet cluster, and all of those effects. And people, as of now, there is no way of explanation of gravitational lensing and the fact that when those 
two galactic cluster merge, apparently the hot gas had separated from where the most of the mass is, which we see by gravitational lensing. So the blue is where the mass is, the red is where hot gas is. And the hot gas is friction, has friction, that's why it separates. The dark matter for all purposes has very little self-interaction and uh, neither do stars for that matter, because the cross-section of two stars colliding when the, those, those galactic clusters collide is also very low. That's why those components separate. And you can see the gas in X-ray and you can see the dark matter with gravitational lensing. <clears throat> but the, again, the biggest reason why we think that dark matter is here is for the simple fact that we exist together with the galaxies. Because there is no way of actually make the galaxies which we see now without the dark matter. And that comes from the observation of cosmic microwave background. So this is an imprint of the universe when the hydrogen finally formed and the photons became free streaming. Because before that time, when you have plasma, the photons scatter all the time. But then when neutral hydrogen is, can finally form because the universe cooled down, those photons are left free. And that's what cosmic microwave background, what we observe here is those photons from the 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And what we see is those red and blue spots at different temperatures, which come also from a, a very, very small changes in the density of matter. And the density of matter at CMB, <clears throat> it's about 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus four, the over density is the changes, changes in density. And from those changes in density, we eventually get more and more changes in density and then more and more matter attracted and how now we have galaxies. So the question is, how does it happen? And people can actually model the formation of large scale structures and they can compare it with what is observed. By the way, that's how universe actually looks like at large scales. It's not just we have a galaxy here and galaxy there, there is a web. And the question is, how do you build this web? And you can simulate that. And if you start with those over density, until they are small, they scale as a redshift. At redshift at CMB, it's 1100. So multiply 1100 by 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five. We should have stiff, have, still have over density of less than one. We should not have galactic structure formation, which looks like this without the dark matter. Now the dark matter can actually start clumping as soon as it's essentially almost it's decoupled <clears throat> uh, from the rest of the universe. And it's still very, very cold. It can, it can start uh, condensing substantially earlier than the CMB. So in fact, you can just simulate the universe with the dark matter only. And you can put lots of you know, dark matter particle and all you do is turn the gravity on and you forget that normal matter exists and you will get correct large scale structure. Only when you get to <clears throat> simulation of Milky Way of individual galaxies, you actually have to add the normal matter to see how they look like to get correct results. Well, then what is dark matter? Well, there are many, many theories. And our simplest theory is that we simply have an extra particle. Could be extra particles, most likely, but let's say just one particle. So where do you look for it? Well, the first idea, and it's, I think it's a great idea, it's to find the particles which you already think exist because they solve some other problem which has nothing to do with dark matter. For example, the hierarchy problems, problem of the, why the Higgs field is so barely on. In order to solve it, people introduce supersymmetry of various other theories which leave, <clears throat> lead us to believe there is some sort of a particle somewhere at you know, 100 GeV to a TeV, and that's what those weakly interactive massive particles were meant to be. And it's a great idea to look for them because it's a highly motivated because it solves the matter antimatter asymmetry problems, the hierarchy problem, and the dark matter problem, all at once with one particle. There are some other problems it doesn't solve, but nevertheless, it's reasonable to assume that, well, if you have many problems that the, and the particle can solve all of them, that's great, right? So people looked for those weakly interactive massive particles. They tried to produce supersymmetric particles at LHC, and so far, unfortunately, we have not seen them. It'd be great if you actually see them in the next generation of experiments. And those could be 100% dark matter. And then also there are axions which lie like somewhere <clears throat> right here. And they were supposed to solve a strong CP problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Why strong interaction 
has charge does not have charge parity violation. And the reason why we so far think it doesn't, it's because the EDM of neutron so far is very, very small. In fact, it's uh, 10 orders of magnitude smaller than it should have been. And that's another one of the puzzles called the uh, uh, strong CP problem. And axions we introduced to solve this. And axion is a very light particle, 10 to the minus six electron volt. And in principle, it could also be dark, 100% dark matter. We know how to produce it. But it's quite possible that both of those, uh, all of those problems have nothing to do with dark matter whatsoever. That there's some other particle which is dark matter, or actually, in fact, we can solve uh, uh, those problems with a relaxion, which is ultra light and could be like somewhere right here as well, because there are multiple solutions of those problems. And uh, in this case, if you just search for dark matter, we frankly have no idea what its mass is or interactions with the standard model. And then our strategy is to essentially look at all possible masses and very interesting things happen if dark matter is very light. Um, perhaps, uh, can we ask questions during the talk or then the Zoom people can, cannot hear them? Okay, so we'll do everything afterwards. <clears throat> so now, how do we detect normally dark matter? If dark matter is some sort of pipe particle at the TV scale, then we essentially look at the dark matter hitting uh, something in your detection material, hitting a nuclei and then scatters and there's energy uh, which comes from recoil and you detect either heat, charge or photons. And that works very well when thing is very heavy because now you have tens of keV of recoil energy which you can detect with various detectors. That's how people search for WIMPs. Then of course it becomes lighter. It does nothing to the nuclei, it doesn't deposit enough energy, but you can look at various effects of scattering on electrons. And then when that doesn't work, because again, it's so light, it, uh, even when it hits an electron, the electron doesn't feel much, then you look for possible absorption. You can look for dark matter uh, this way. And then of course, you also use some sort of a superconducting materials and you essentially look for its breaking Cooper pairs. But eventually when you get to EV or under EV energy deposition, there is no material which can detect it. And also some other interesting things will happen. Uh, first, dark matter now galaxy, if it's less than 10 electron volts, it's Fermi energy. But remember quantum mechanics, you can't pack too many fermions together. So from a Fermi energy, there is associated a Fermi velocity. So Fermi velocity for dark matter with mass less than 10 electron volt, it's higher than our galactic escape velocity. So ultralight dark matter under 10 electron volt has to be bosonic. And then if it's bosonic, then a good question to ask when you have many, many then particles, what is De Broglie wavelengths? And then what's De Broglie volume? And then how many particles do you get per De Broglie volume? And if the mass is 10 to the minus six electron volt, do you know how many particles we have per De Broglie volume? 10 to the 30. So we're no longer talking about looking at individual particles. For all purposes, we are looking at the classical field of the cosine uh, um, omega t, and there is a bit of a dispersion because dark matter is virally supported. So it moves at random velocities at about 200 kilometers per second. So it's cold. And then we know how to look for those things because we know what waves do to various technologies. And then we looked now for the effects which are coherent on the scale of your detector or networks of detector. So it's not that we uh, want to specifically, well, of course we won't use quantum technology, but also we kind of have to at this point because those are the devices which are particularly sensitive to those types of attacks. So what will this wave do to your quantum technology? Well, you can say, well, I don't know what's mass is or what it does to the standard model. How would I know what it does to my magnetometer or my large scale atom interferometer? Well, but we shouldn't forget that we understand quantum field theory. And if it's a particle, then when, what do we know about it? Okay, let's say we know that this mass is less than the electron volt. What else can we know about it? Well, it should have spin or it doesn't. So it's spin zero, one, two, etc., And it also should have definite parity. And even if it does have a weird case when you can be the scalar and pseudo scalar at the same time, okay, so it has scalar and pseudo scalar couplings. So we know how to couple scalar, pseudo scalar vector to the, you know, our standard model Lagrangian. So we don't have to know how it couples, we just assume that it does. 
And then we look at all possible couplings it can make. And then we look at all possible effects those couplings can produce in quantum technologies. So here's our detection strategy. We list all possible couplings, what particle physicists call the low dimensional operator, meaning that's the strongest coupling, which is allowed unless it's prohibited for some reason. Then we write a list and it's a fairly short list. Because by the time you get to the tensor, you get field theory problems. So let's skip to the scalars, to the scalars, vectors, axial vectors. And then it can only do actually only four different things. It can process spins. So your ultralight dark matter wave will process electron, nuclear, and et cetera, spins. It will drive currents, electromagnetic systems. That's how you search for axions. It literally will produce photons. You can have, you know, action in the magnetic field will produce a photon. And you can look for that photon. Then it will induce equivalence principle violations of matter. And of course, in this building, that's uh, something which atom interferometers can look for. So why, by the way, it's induced uh, equivalence principle violation? Because you just allow your dark matter to couple differently to protons, neutrons, electrons, and photons. And therefore, automatically, depending on composition of your material, it now uh, works differently because now it's dependent on the material composition. And then, and I'll show why, it will modulate the values of all fundamental constants in nature. And the reason why constants in quote, because if they're modulators, they're no longer constants. And then if you look what kind of technologies, what kind of quantum sensors are sensitive to those effects that you can look at magnetometers, the cavities, uh, any trapped ions or qubits, atom interferometers, laser interferometers, optical cavity, any GV detector, uh, atomic molecular, nuclear clock, and any of the precision spectroscopy involving cooling and trapping, essentially sensitive to one or more of those effects. And that's why quantum technologies are so great to look for dark matter. And in fact, there've been a lot of searches and uh, there is a recent book, The Search for Light Dark Matter. I highly recommend it if you're interested in the field. It's a good thing that it's free. So all you have to go to the Springer link. In fact, you can just Google it and download it. It's essentially a textbook. So it, that's actually very comprehensible at a you know, first year graduate uh, school level. <clears throat> also, it has tutorials and it has a lot of exercises which are actually solved in the end of the book. So a great care has been taken to actually make it as comprehensible as possible. It even has a chapter of astrophysical searches for the light dark matter and uh, stuff about astrophysical simulations, but it has all about the, the axions, the clocks, the scalars, uh, and uh, there are, I think about 10 chapters on different topics in there. So now uh, what does our group do in uh, dark matter searches? So we look how to search for dark matter with various quantum technologies, for now mostly with clocks. And then we also see how to compare different approaches. We look at the new ideas in dark matter searches. <clears throat> and now we look to clocks in space. So we actually now, uh, I'll show a little bit about this, new ideas about looking for various transient signals. But then we kind of uh, decided that besides just looking at the how to do dark matter searches with clocks, we also need to know more about dark matter. So we collaborate with particle theory on various dark matter specific models to see if we can actually make specific models when we know what the parameter space is and how to reach it with quantum technologies. And then uh, also now we look at various ideas in dark matter distribution, because the one thing which you do not know, it's what distribution of dark matter in the solar system actually is. We know approximately how much dark matter we should have on a solar system, kind of where the sun rotates around the galaxy, kind of in our place in the galaxy, but this is averages. This has nothing to do with our specifics of the solar system or specifics of dark matter whatsoever. And I'll talk about that as well. And it, it really matters for your detection whether your dark matter is just some particles spread somewhere or they actually form compact objects and whether those compact objects are kind of stuck there or they can bind to say things like a sun or black holes or if those objects can actually explode like supernovas. So in the, actually all of those scenarios is allowed and it's very significant to affect the detection strategies. So now, uh, recently we put together a paper for the snow mass process, which is a US uh, particle physics planning exercise. And uh, as you see, this is just searches for scalar and vector dark matter. And you see pretty much all of the quantum technologies have been used to do so. So I'll specifically talk about clocks. Uh, while probably we have most of experts in the room, just a quick reminder how clocks work, because uh, how clock work uh, limits 
on how broadband the dark matter searches with clocks can be, what kind of masses of dark matter and what kind of couplings you can actually probe for. So for all purposes, a clock is a tuning instrument. So you tune your laser to the frequency of your atoms. That's a very basic idea. And now you keep tuning your laser until you essentially own resonance with atomic transition and then you lock it, you, you check the frequency with optical frequency comp. And the basic idea that the way you do it, you do Ramsey scheme, you do pi over two pulse, then you wait and you do another pi over two pulse. So during that wait time, it matters how many dark matter oscillations happen because if it's less than one that you accumulate it, if it's more than one, you start actually smearing them. Then you have to use various uh, quantum algorithm protocols like dynamic decoupling to actually be able to observe signals which oscillate faster than your prop time. So I, I talked about it yesterday, so I won't talk today, but if you're interested, ask me about it. So why do dark matter, why does dark matter modulate the values of fundamental constant? Here is a, one of the ways you can couple dark matter. So if dark matter is a scalar, it has what's called a dilatonic coupling. And it's very simple. So this is your standard model Lagrangians, which you know and love. So here are your photons, electrons, gluons, quarks. And now, as you see, each term in front has this coupling constant that determines the strength of interaction between dark matter and this particular standard model particle. And on top, uh, you just multiply the whole thing just by the field. For the uh, pseudoscalars, you actually multiply by the gradient of the field. But here, you just multiply by your oscillating cosine field. And a kappa, well, it's some very, very small number because we know that it doesn't really interact with dark matter much with the standard model. And uh, if you just now add this interacting term to your normal Lagrangian term and switch to the particle data group designations from the DE to the G gamma, then your alpha, that's your standard model alpha is now modified by the alpha standard model plus small oscillating term and the mass also gets small oscillating term. What does it mean? That now all of your normal standard model constants become oscillating. And what you do in order to separate units from actual effects, you look at the dimensionless ratios of those constants. You look at the fine structure variation constant, you look at the electron to proton mass ratio, and you look to the quark masses to lambda QCD, for example, which is a QCD mass scale. So what does it do to clocks? So now you dark matter field couples to magnetic interactions to normal matter. It will make fundamental constants in all the masses oscillate, and of course, all the energy levels of everything depends on those fundamental constants. So now the atomic nuclear molecular energy levels oscillate, therefore your clock frequency oscillates. Well, compare the frequencies of two clocks, pick the ones which have different sensitivity to those effects because the heavier atoms are more sensitive than lighter atoms because effects is relativistic. There's additional correlation, uh, correction enhancements, molecular clock have different sensitivities. Nuclear clock have completely different sensitivity. So just pick the one and monitor the ratio. You can also, when you have this beautiful ultra stable cavity, the cavity length will oscillate. So you can just compare a clock to cavity if your cavity in, has an essentially independent frequency standard. And do it for I mean, as long as possible. So now there is portable and automated clocks which can run for a long time. And some of those comparisons now go back 15 years. So how broadband is it? Well, uh, you should have at least one dark matter oscillation for your measurement time, because what you do, you take your measurement sequence of the, of the time of the ratios of frequencies, and then you do Fourier transfer to the frequency domain. In the frequency domain, you should have a peak at the Compton dark matter frequency. So it is a dete direct detection experiment. You essentially look at your power spectrum and uh, you should see at this frequency, you should actually see a peak. Also, it's a verifiable signal because we know the amplitudes uh, of those peaks should be proportional to ratios of sensitivities of those clocks. And now how broadband is it? Well, if you measure for 11 days, it's down to six seconds, you get to about 10 to the minus 21 uh, electron volt. Now, if you actually measure for 10 to the eight seconds, which my particle physics colleagues are happy to commit a more experimentalists, you can get all the way down to the actual astrophysical limits uh, and you can get to 10 to the minus 23. By the way, 10 to the eight seconds is three years. 
but well, I mean, clocks in meteorology institute supposed to be keep running for years. So in principle, that's not impossible. And we do have that long comparisons. But now on the heavier masses, we have a bit of a problem because one hertz is 10 to the minus 15. So if your Ramsey time is actually exceeding one, one second, now we have multiple dark mode oscillations. And in this case, to probe anything, you know, down to 10 to the minus, say, 12, you do need to apply this a lot of Pi pulses, you rotate your vector on a block sphere between the Ramsey time, during the Ramsey time, and that allows you to get those oscillating constants. But I think I, I haven't seen anyone enthusiastic enough that you can actually apply pulses in megahertz. So about 10 to the minus nine, you definitely have to switch to different technologies like optical cavities in some of the precision spectroscopy experiments are actually sensitive in that range. And now, so how do we improve upon the current limits? Well, first we can actually improve the clocks. There have been fantastic progress with clocks and just how far the rabbit hole goes, ask your favorite uh, AMO experimentalist. It's heavily dependent level of optimism of person you talk to. And uh, also it seems to be changing this time. So I remember 10 years ago or 15 years ago, 10 to the minus 18 was like a final goal of the whole effort. And now people say, yeah, 10 minus 19, we will have in a few years, 10 to the minus 20, again, depending who you talk to, sure. And there is no technical limit, uh, honestly, uh, at a few orders of magnitude we should be limited to. So now uh, the measurements beyond the quantum limit, meteorologically useful quantum squeezing is coming, a large ion crystals are coming, new, the, Quite a lot of different new designs for lattice clocks, the tweezers, the 3D, those multi-segmented traps, the multi-ensemble clocks are coming, and the entangled clocks eventually coming. But also we can build different clocks based on highly charged ions, nuclear clocks, and molecular clocks. And those have different sensitivities to different fundamental constants or much higher sensitivity to current constants. So many, many new things are coming. Uh, so, and also in our group, we and our collaborators will look at what other new effects we can explore. So generally you hear is that if you have two optical clocks in your lab, that you're only sensitive to variation of fundamental physics constant, which is fine structure constant. This is turns out to be not so. And the reason why it's not so, because well, uh, we do have quarks inside atoms. We kind of forget about them, but they are there. So now quarks also couple to the, your dark matter and so are gluons. So what does it do? Well, it will make the proton radius oscillate. Uh, we sort of fixing, you know, most of us fix the proton radius puzzle, but now protons is actually a little bit oscillating. That's a very small effect. And it automatically comes from the fact that you can couple dark matter to quarks and gluons. What will it do to atoms? Well, the first thing it will do something to nuclei. The charge radius will now oscillate. It's fairly non-trivial to recalculate between the two, but you know we can just do the modeling. And then what it will do, it will actually make the frequency oscillate because remember, field shift, the isotope shift depends on the radius of the nuclei. But now the sensitivity is very different. Sensitivity has nothing to do with alpha whatsoever. So you can actually extract couplings to the gluons, quarks, and by the way, to the QCD axion from the optical clock frequency ratios, <clears throat> because now your figure of merit, it's a field shift difference between two clocks. So now you pick two clocks or two different transitions in the same uh, nuclei. They don't have to be in the same nuclei, by the way, which have the largest differences of field shift constants. So now everyone suddenly wants to know what the field shifts are. And also there is kind of links to the whole nonlinearity of the King's plus measurement as well. So uh, we have actually computed those things in a terbium plus clock for the reason because we'll be interested in analyzing this nonlinearity of the King's plot, which is a whole different story. And now you can directly connect the frequency ratios of the atomic clocks to the gluonic coupling and to the mass coupling for the quarks and actually to the QCD axion. And you can actually uh, try to search for those effects as well. And it turns out to be that even with the current Euterbium plus clock measurements, you in fact can improve a little bit already on the parameter space, but then you can actually improve it fairly significantly. And then you can probe and explore a parameter space for gluonic coupling before we get a nuclear clock. The nuclear clock sensitivity will be like somewhere like right there, by the way. So, but nevertheless, now we do have an alternative to look for them. So if a nuclear clock shows what the frequency is, maybe we can actually get the dynamic by dynamic decoupling there with, with other clocks with highly charged ions. And uh, it become now interesting how to compute isotope shifts uh, for a large number of systems. And isotope shift computation is not difficult. All you do, you just look at energy variation 
but you have to enhance the field shift effects by multiplying uh, your Hamiltonian by some constant lambda, make it large so you can actually see the effect on the energy level calculation. But it means you have to compute for multiple lambdas. And honestly, it's a pain. If you ever try to produce lots of different input files, which just differ by one number, it's very boring, I can tell you. And put each one in the right directory, making sure you haven't made a single mistake, then run five different calculations and collect all the data and get the derivative. It's a nightmare. We try to avoid doing isotope shift calculations as much as possible because of it. But we thought, well, now we collaborate with computer scientists and they always tell you, if you do it twice by hand, you should automate it. And they've been trying to follow this um, as much as possible. So uh, Charles Chang, a postdoc of our group, wrote actually a Python script, which just does everything for you. We, we already automated like a base at productions, you know, and so on. So all you have to do is to have small input file. Okay, I want to compute the uh, isotope shift for say, you know, Ethereum plus or whatever that is. And uh, then uh, I would like to set a Lambda on this and this, and Thorium uh, has those input files. And here is a, you know, how you would like to build configuration interaction and all order. It's like literally a very small file, which pretty much I can explain to you how to fill. And then it makes five directories. It populates the directories. It uh, runs a, the, the single processor codes first, and then it actually can actually check on a cluster what's free and it would submit job actually uh, to the free portion of the cluster, or you just don't bother with it and just submit it and it waits for like a day and then gets in. And then the most importantly, then, uh, then you run the, when everything is done, you run the same Python script again and I check and ask you analyze and click yes, and you just get the CSV table with field shifts. So much more convenient and we actually, uh, we recomputed one case which we had published and it worked. So in principle, we can scan for the sensitivity factors for highly charged ions and uh, <clears throat> then try to find the ions which particular large sensitivities. And you see, it's amazing that that was missed. For 10 years, people have repeated that, oh, well, I mean, it's only sensitive to alpha, maybe for 20 years. So even though uh, also you can use hyperfine constants as well because there are effects on hyperfine constants for, for the matter. And now, of course, uh, can we use nuclei in order to build clocks? And of course, the problem is that we need ultra stable tabletop laser to build a clock. So the wavelengths of whatever clock you're building, the wavelengths of your nuclear transition has to be amenable to excitation by a laser, high precision laser. Even I am not optimistic that we'll have tabletop MEV lasers in my lifetime. So, and that's usually where all the nuclear transitions are. They like kill electron volts, but mostly mega electron volts. 10 to the six electron volts, and mostly now we are like in 10 AV electron volt on land. And that's by 10 AV, you're already in UV. And yes, we have, do have XU frequency comps, but remember, you need to be able to excite very weak transition. So it turns out to be there is a single nuclear so far known, uh, thorium-229. And the nuclear transition now has been measured. And uh, by the way, radiative decay just have been seen uh, last year. And uh, they do see photons coming out, even though uh, they don't, no one yet laser excited the transition. They actually see the photons come out because you have uranium, to, you have, I think they actually had actinium, which decayed into thorium, and then thorium was produced in isomeric state and that decay radiatively, and they're actually seen it in a crystal. By the way, making those crystals is a nightmare, making sure they're still UV transparent with a 148 nanometer radiation. It's non trivial. So now uh, we have the ERC collaboration with Thurston Schumacher, Kurt Pike, and Peter Thierolf to build three nuclear clocks within the next five years. And then we hope that within um, you know, 10 years, it could be actually a high precision clock. The reason why it's so interesting, it's because the figure of merit here for variation of alpha, it's a ratio of your transition energy to the difference in Coulomb energy. And because Coulomb energy itself, it's like GeV scale. So we hope that the Coulomb energy difference would be somewhere in a MeV scale. Because look, nine digit numbers don't cast to zero for no reason. There are a lot of nuclei, but not 10 to the 9 nuclei for that accidentally to happen. And the uh, nuclear clock would also be sensitive to the quark masses to lambda QCD. What I just showed you, it's a unique coupling. Uh, and the enhancement factors also will be extremely large. And we really hope that uh, it can be built fairly fast because all you, so finally, with the knowledge of energy, which is known right now, 
you have a reasonable scanning time with a gigahertz laser. And as soon as you can actually find this transition with a gigahertz laser, then you can down it uh, to uh, fairly, fairly narrow. So you improve by immediately by 10 orders, you know, six or so orders of magnitude right away. And then you have to scan it with a high precision frequency count. <clears throat> now, so one of the essentially main issues building lasers is 148 nanometers. So if it were an optical, we would have had the clock by now. It was predicted to be an op in the visible range, but it's not. So there are various other technologies which can look for scalar dark matter. So during, again, the snow mass process, we have been uh, asked by the conveners of the snow mass to produce a white paper on search for the scalar and vector ultralight dark matter. And <clears throat> I've been, uh, as a convener, I've been uh, tasked by the role to essentially produce this paper. And apparently, the way the particle physics do it, you ask for volunteers. Have you ever written a review paper by volunteers? Usually people have been volunteered to write review papers. And then, you know, after a year, you actually remember that you agreed to write the review paper and then you scramble to when journal sends, you know, all those warnings to you that you've promised us review paper a year ago, you actually start writing it. And a year later, hopefully you actually write the paper. It's a very long process. I've done that before. <clears throat> Here, uh, I've, I made a Google form and I posted it on Slack and I immediately had like 20 volunteers who were volunteered as a people when we found that we have some gaps in knowledge. I and Swati Sink was, was as a coordinator, distributed people, you know, by the field. And of course, uh, then we uh, asked some more other people from, you know, quantum technologists community to fill in some of the gaps. By the way, we had the two particle physics graduate students to write a very nice section of atom interferometry, by the way. So, uh, and, uh, but then the problem which we had that every section, the clocks, the interferometers, the optical interferometers, the cavities, the micro resonant, uh, you know, the mechanical resonators, the qubit people, they all had their parameter exclusion plots. No one ever in this field to try to do any combined plots. So we said we are going to be the first. Again, we found volunteers, surprisingly, to do it. And uh, here is the first combined plot. Now, by the way, you can actually, oh, this is missing the PTB one, so I replaced it. So there is a new PTB measurement like right here. So, and uh, by right now, all of those plots actually maintained by CR and O'Hara together with axion limits. So if you have a new highly charged ion or other experiment or the atom interferometry, you can just go download the Jupyter notebook and plot uh, whatever parameter space you want. So don't pay much attention to naturalness bound. Particle physicist likes to draw naturalness bound, it's great. But frankly, we have no idea where the naturalness lines is. So uh, it, it, 10 CV, it's uh, what the Higgs naturalness line approximately is. Uh, and then it could be electron mass just as well. So here is a current clock limit. Uh, sorry, again, the PCB limit is like right there. And then a projected clock limit for nuclear clock is you see how enormous parameter space uh, could be uh, actually probed. And that's assumption is 10 to the minus 19 and uh, I think 8,000 uh, sensitivity factor from the current literature. Uh, by the way, here is a magist at one kilometer. So if you, some may know, this is a, uh, atom interferometer uh, experiment. So the ion one kilometer, uh, we try, I try to ask Tim Kovacha why is that different? I think it's just whatever parameters you fit, uh, how many, uh, the, what is H bar K and what's, what's your atom source uh, in there will produce different strains. And this is a uh, IEG in space. So those are also projections for various mechanical resonators. So as you see, uh, also you can, you can get the limits for the DME for the, uh, and for the vectors uh, and for all axions, there are lots of axion plots on the same website as well. And also you can get all the references where all the data is coming from. So if you have a new experiment, I suggest uh, send it to Sierra and so he can add it to the list and so he doesn't miss it. So now, as you see, the search for the scalar vector uh, in the pseudo-scalar dark matter has been a growing field. Uh, the past snow mass, if you look at 10 years snow mass ago, there is like in the document, there is like a paragraph about axions and the, you know, more and more pages about WIMS. So the problem which we get is now the dark matter field exploded. So this time, uh, to the particle dark matter, I think there were like 150 papers, uh, white papers submitted, and there'll be like 100 to the wave like dark matter. So the DOE is interested in the US what to do about all of this, because uh, particle physics normally doesn't function on build, you know, funding 100 experiments. So uh, that'll be very interesting. So it's kind of everything is in flux to see you know, how that's going to be done. In the US, many of the AMO colleagues are funded by actually private foundations. But now, for example, Fermilab is building Magis 100, the 100 meter 
Adam Deformator. And I know there is uh, also effort in Europe with MIGA and uh, uh, ION, and then there is China has ZIGA. So the atomic physics now starting going from, you know, one lap in the basement to larger and larger collaborators, you know, collaborations. And that's quite interesting. Also, we promote lots of collaborations, particle physics. The interesting uh, new factor is that NASA got very interested in quantum sensors. So they invited me to headquarters to give a talks to the different program managers, they organize workshops. <clears throat> also, different NASA divisions apparently has their own decade of survey, which is supposed to recommend them what they should be doing in the next 10 years. So I'm on the physical sciences panel for this biological and physical sciences and space survey. Uh, it's not obvious, but essentially that include anything from growing plants on ISS to develop new combustion for the mission to Mars to building stuff on the moon, and for some reason to dark matter searches with clocks in space. And uh, they are going to be a decade or so are going to be out in the summer. So NASA just established of a fundamental physics analysis group, and we'll have a meeting on, on May 23rd, 25th in Santa Barbara. And that's kind of interesting effort. They would like us community to advise NASA on how to interpret the decade of survey. So I am uh, now officially the chair of this group. So we will have executive committee, which will be from uh, US institutions, but then we would like to actually you know, ask all of you to help with what you think actually be a good pathways uh, in order to send quantum technologies to space. And of course, that will be, you know, going to take quite some time, but there'll be some possibly interesting possibilities for the research and development, and we'll see, like, where that's all going to lead us. Because the previous decadal survey resulted on Cold Atom Lab, so it has been successful, but we'll see then what the next stage should be. So why would you actually want to search for fundamental physics in space as opposed to on Earth? <clears throat> well, because there are some conditions of space which we just cannot duplicate here. And some of the experiments would be screened on Earth or just can't be done on Earth. Or we can actually have much higher sensitivities in space. Why? Well, first, because sitting on Earth's surface hinders a lot of tests of gravity and general relativity specifically. For example, <clears throat> you can immediately improve an anomalous redshift if you're outside uh, the Earth's surface, if you have access to variable gravitational potentials. So first also, if you would like to do optical transfer to link clocks and PTB, Riken and um, NIST, for example, and uh, being able to link clocks on different continents, one of the possibilities is either have a clock on geo-orbit or at least cavity and frequency comes on geo-orbit, but best to actually have a clock. And uh, that would link uh, the clock network on Earth and also allow for a uh, look for certain trends and effects which actually requires networks. But then also some of the dark matter, quadratic interaction, dark matter for scalars is screened on Earth partially. Dark energy will be also significantly screened on Earth. And also the testing of fundamental, some of the fundamental symmetries like Lorentz invariance are fixed into the parameter space with Earth, which links to the Earth's rotation. So with a satellite, you can actually look at all the different parameters. Uh, then you have access to variable gravitational potential as a elliptical orbit, strongly elliptical orbit around Earth, or a flyby uh, on elliptical orbit around the sun, uh, or you can actually just send things away uh, from Earth uh, towards Saturn and go, you know, uh, look at the significant differences with what we get at the actual Earth orbit. Then uh, some experiments just need long baselines. All the gravitational wave experiments, which you go beyond uh, millihertz, would require longer baselines. And all of them will have to be in space. And they could be with laser interferometry, atom interferometry, or we will have to look at the, what possible technologies we have. Like people you know, would like to build stuff on the moon, for example, as well. Due to very small seismic activity, moon effectively essentially is a resonant bar, which you can then look for, listen to the moon, gravitational wave with acoustic sensors. So there's a lot of different uh, possibilities which you can do. Also, some of the dark matter, especially transients, if you do want to prove that you've just seen a relativistic burst with clocks, you cannot burn Earth because Earth, the clocks will never integrate that fast to actually see a relativistic burst. They could see the passage of cold dark matter transient, but not the relativistic ones. Magnetometers possibly can, but mostly you will have to have a network in space to actually look for it. You can look for it here, but the proof that it's relativistic burst, you actually have to have long distances. And then, of course, you have very cool objects. You have the sun, the moon, and the asteroids. 
So there could be possibilities of extreme overdensity of dark matter bound to the sun. The moon uh, you can use for gravity tests. You also very ex extremely low seismic environment. And then, well, you have free cryogenics and free vacuum on the moon. There is a places of the moon which are permanently cryogenic. And literally, there's a fantastic talks I've heard about, you know, building stuff there. And the people ask, how do you going to power that if it's kind of permanently dark? That's okay. We either build a nuclear reactor or we're going to beam the power from, you know, the top of the uh, crater, which is kind of fantastic. I, I, I like the, um, the enthusiasm. So, <laughs> so, but look, eventually that actually may happen. Uh, but, but you have to start somewhere. And as of now, we have very, very few quantum technologies which ever been to space since they mostly last five years. So, and then asteroids can actually serve as test masses, uh, which is the only way to detect gravitation waves of certain range. So I've been asked to participate in this focus proposal. And this is <clears throat> the main reason for it is look for general relativity violations, look for the anomalous redshift in space. So here we have one optical clock and it is 10 to the minus 18 clock. And we still have to discuss whether it can be an ion or it has to be lattice due to stability or not. But it's a single clock and uh, you compare the frequency of this clock with identical clock on Earth. Uh, at the nearest passage in the uh, furthest away passage, and that actually allows you to literally look at the variation of frequencies and reject errors. This clock will also be a meteorological reference for any clock on Earth. On Earth. You do have to determine orbit pretty well, but uh, you know, at least the GPL estimate this is fairly, it seems reasonable for them. And this is a current best limit uh, from the Galilee satellite. And you know, with this clock on orbit, you can reach 10 to the minus nine. You also can do some other tests of relativity, look some post Newtonian parameters, and then you can establish high accuracy international time and geodesic reference. The price cost estimated for 100 million. So sending anything, it's expensive to space. So that's why we would like to actually think about what other things you can actually do with a setup like this. So we've been asking collaboration with the particle physics community as to what other dark matter things you can look with clocks in space and atom interferometers in space, which you can't do on Earth. And one interesting thing we can look for is look for the dark matter distribution or use some enhanced possible enhancements of dark matter distribution in order to be able to actually dissect dark matter better. So frankly, we don't have the faintest idea of what the actual distribution of dark matter in our galaxy is. We know approximately how much dark matter we can have, and we can distribute it with you know, some sort of distribution profile. And that's where this um, one kind of uh, you know, hydrogen atom per three cubic centimeter uh, at the solar position comes from. But this is averages. This is not actual measurements in the solar system. The measurements in the solar system from planetary motion gets gives you that you allow it over densities of X total matter, not just dark matter, total matter, be it about 10 to the minus eight solar masses level, which is five orders of magnitude away from this one proton per cubic centimeter. And again, that's total mass, there's no dark matter mass because we can't separate the mass of the sun right now to normal matter and dark matter. There are no limits for this. So now, uh, what astro, uh, other things can be? Well, we could be in some dark matter stream. We could uh, have dark matter remnant from other galaxies, Milky Way 8, which haven't yet been stripped, for example. Uh, we could have compact objects, which uh, are produced by self-interactions of dark matter. We can actually have dark matter bound to stars, planets. Uh, there is a special case, what happens when we have rotating black holes, they actually trap and produce ultralight fields, which can then be ejected. And then we can actually have topological defects and then the list gets weird afterwards. So, but frankly, we have no idea. So we would like to look at the possible effects. My interest in how do they affect detection? And also I would like to make sure that when we postulate that, okay, we have uh, one Bosanova explodes a kiloparsec from Earth because we would like to detect at least one per year. It's not contradicting really cosmology or you know, observed astronomical uh, effects. So that's also, you know, you have to set reasonable limits, but also you have to look that it's not contradicting this existing data. So we also have been actually tried to constrain dark matter in the solar system. There is a new mission by NASA, which actually managed to land. They landed a mission on the asteroid for the first time. It's very tricky because uh, asteroids don't have that much gravity. So the, you have to track the satellite actually 
very precisely. And if we actually had a, some sort of atom-based uh, you know, accelerometer on that satellite, it would be so much easier because then you can tell what the non-gravitation accelerations are. So people have modeled that it could reduce by you know, significant factors the tracking time to actually do so. So that's some other interesting use of quantum sensors in space. But what they did, they managed to determine orbit very precisely. It's the most precisely known asteroidal orbit. And the interesting part is if you have some extra matter in the solar system, which is somehow spread around the sun, then it will cause extra precession of the perihelion with asteroids. And we actually get the limit, which is fairly comparable to the planetary limit. So uh, then we've uh, been inspired by the Parker Solar Probe. Who knows what that is? It's essentially a mission which pretty much touched the corona of the sun. And it didn't die, and it actually transmits the data. So it measures some of the you know, particle data and the magnetic field data near the sun. We actually talked to the GPL people who are responsible for this. And it looks like uh, you can actually place clocks on a type of mission like this, and they won't just die there. There is a you know, fantastic heat shield, and the magnetic fields actually, even at that level in the closed approach right now, it's still actually reasonable. So have you thought about what would clocks do if we actually uh, send a probe that's close to the sun? And uh, well, if there is a dark matter halo bound to the sun, then you can have huge extra densities of dark matter particles near the sun. So in this case, you don't need a link to Earth. All you do, you, you pack your clock comparison, a lab and nice boxes which won't die in space and send it to the sun. Uh, you don't need to be in an orbit around the sun. Essentially, you need four hours on a, you know, elliptical flyby, which you, of course, get much, much more time than this. But the 10 to the minus 13 masses, they're coherent for about four hours. And then we'll actually look at the profile and the dark matter halo distribution profile. And the halo can form because of gravitational binding, also because of self-interactions. There are models when the, uh, if you have a gravitational object, you can actually have dark matter bind to it. And this is a density profile. And the density profile is actually, uh, first it's specific to a distance. We used a 0 0.1 atomic unit, astronomical units from the sun. And uh, that's as a normal HALA profile, that's your 0 0.3 GV per centimeter cube. And this is essentially over density. So for every one particle normal HALA, you can get 10 to the 17 particles at about 10 to the minus 13 electron volts mass near the sun. So if such hail exists there, you have 10 to the more than 17 chances to detect it, even if you have uh, less sensitivity, if not than minus 18 clock, but maybe somewhat less, it's still actually a very interesting opportunity to do. So this is a proposed densities. And of course, my particle physics colleagues are very happy to already send a nuclear clock to space. If it's done within the next 15 years, this full purposes already exists. So in this case, you can actually be well within the relaxion bounds and that's probably the only thing which allows you to reach the relaxion. And relaxion, it's a very interesting ultralight particle, which could be dark matter, but also solves a hierarchy problem. So there is a specific parameter space. And then we looked at the various transient effects in the past couple of minutes. I will tell you about the transients. This is an ongoing project with Vladimir Tahistov and uh, uh, Josh Abel from Tokyo. And we looked, we want to look at the all possible transient signal. So what does a transient signal mean? This oscillating signal is always on. For transient signal, you have a burst. You essentially do have oscillating signal during the time and then goes away. So for all purposes, it acts on dark matter. Its coherence property are different. So its coherence property now are not defined by the mass. They're defined by the burst itself. So it's because the burst is extremely short, even though you have a dispersion, but technically you have effective coherence during the burst. <clears throat> So here is one uh, kind of <clears throat> quite possible objects. I mean, it's been modeled for axioms, but uh, we actually looked at the modeling for scalars and it works about the same way. Let's say now you have uh, dark matter, which starts making compact objects. So first you can just do it for due to gravity. And if you have small density, you balance the kinetic term by the gravitational term. But now if it acquires more and more field, then you actually have a self-interactions which kick in. And self-interactions usually have some sort of self-interaction potential and you expand it around small perturbation. And you will have first attractive term, but then you will actually get repulsive term as a normal Taylor expansion. And then interesting thing happens. When you have a very, very large over density, it will explode. So why would it explode? Well, first, uh, when you have a very, you know, eventually you have more and more interactions, 
and the your self interaction kicks in because you, not, you just have them packed much closer. So eventually, <coughs> the kinetic term cannot hold it against the self interaction, could hold against gravity, but not against the self interactions kicking in. So in this case, it will collapse. The interesting question why doesn't it collapse to a black hole? It will not collapse, collapse to a black hole, which simulation shows for both axions and scalars, that because then repulsive interactions eventually kick in at the next uh, level of precision. So the thing then will eject the matter. So the simulations show that you can eject 30 to 60% of all matter in that compact object. And the burst is mildly relativistic. So now your cold dark matter suddenly becomes relativistic burst. And now when it reaches critical, it explodes and eventually the signal will reach earth. And we plotted what kind of over densities you can get because ultralight particle would gain energy in this collapse due to some uh, additional interactions. And in this case, uh, you can actually have it observable. So in order for the purposes of being able to actually put it some limits on this, we first looked what is actually prohibited by uh, the known astrophysics. And this is prohibited by the hole formation, and this is prohibited by the structure formation. And what you're looking for, it's mass versus self-interaction term constant. And then if one explodes at the parsec near the sun, then uh, this is actually a parameter space when you're exceeding the densities, which is normal here. And uh, when it explodes kiloparsec around the sun, those are the over densities where then uh, significantly larger than dark matter halo. And you can see the over densities again could be orders of magnitude. They can be actually uh, very, very large. So this is interaction parameter increase. So essentially what it does, this uh, di to di. So remember this de, when I show the plot of the um, strengths of interactions. So effectively there, you just take your plot for your clock and essentially it goes down by uh, that amount. It's mass dependent, so you, one has to model it, but now you have much better sensitivity because during the burst, you just have much larger density of the particles. You lose a little bit due to various different coherence properties, but here is, oh, here's actually, we do have a PTB bound here. So this is going to be bound for the HeLa. this is bound for the burst. So for duration of the burst, you have, uh, you know, extra eight orders of magnitude for some specific, we took some sort of benchmark, benchmark parameter space. So as you see, there are more and more reasons to send those various quantum technologies to space. Of course, one question is, here is an optical clock and Jilla. How do you send this to space? Well, I mean, uh, it, that's probably one, you know, what Google felt 10 years ago, looking at the iron trap quantum computing experiments. But we know that those have been miniaturized fantastically. So with quantum formation chips, they're actually very, very small, even though they did look like this before. Now with clocks, also this fantastic effort in a portable clock. So now uh, this is actually also the same clock. It's 10 to the minus 18 strontium optical clock in Riken. And they put one of them at the bottom of Sky Tower and one of the top of Sky Tower and actually one of the best uh, also redshift limits. So we heard there is actually a smaller version, but there is also no optical optic clock on PTB and it's like two boxes that big. And of course, there is also portable clock uh, being built here. So those will get smaller. And eventually, uh, I mean, there is a question, of course, you know, how that will survive the space launch, etc. But in principle, those are hopefully solvable technological problems. So solving fundamental physics problems of 100 years ago gave, gave us quantum mechanics. No one in, in 1930s or in 1950s, or even when they built the first laser, had any idea what effect that would actually have on modern technologies. So the question is, when we solve the fundamental problems of our times, what new interesting discoveries would that bring? Thank you so much for your attention. And I will thank group in Delaware and our collaborators. Thank you.